This is CBC Here and Now. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, this takes sibling rivalry to a whole new level. Meet all of the brothers and sisters running in the provincial election, two of them running for opposing parties. The first transatlantic flight took off 100 years ago, just down the road from the Land Wash Brewery here in Mount Pearl. To celebrate that event this summer, we're making beer. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain, live from the St. John's Newsroom. As we get the Here and Now studio ready for election night, hope you'll tune in then. I think you're going to like what you see. As far as the news goes, we start tonight in Clarenville, where a community mourns the loss of a young hockey star. Hundreds packed the stands of the Clarenville Event Center yesterday to honor the life of 15-year-old Darian Hunt. Darian passed away Saturday after a three-year battle with leukemia. His assistant principal says Darian was proud to play with the Riverside Raptors. The local minor hockey association said it was fitting to celebrate Darian's life in the Caribou's home arena, one of his favorite places to be. And when he saw his friends, he went from not feeling great to probably one of the best days that he had since he'd been here. You may recall Darian's story. He and his family appeared in a WestJet video that went viral two years ago. Back when the airline and Ronald McDonald House teamed up to reunite Darian with his sister and his minor hockey team in Toronto, where he was undergoing cancer treatment. Darian Hunt played with the Clarenville Minor Hockey Association for seven years. To the campaign now, the provincial NDP is promising to put people first. The party is putting a push on as it tries to increase the number of seats that it has in the House of Assembly. But it only has 14 candidates running in an election with 40 districts. And that's the lowest for the NDP since 1972. On Saturday, leader Alison Coffin joined other candidates from the party to put the focus on making life more affordable for families, seniors, as well as young people. Coffin says her party will invest in the services that people need, such as reducing electricity costs, ensuring accessibility to, to child care, and bolstering women's rights. I am hearing that they want uh, they want to see a better policies that are more directed uh, at their their day to day lives that reflect the needs of the people of the province. Everyone deserves the right to have a choice. And if people who are young, who are willing to complain, aren't willing to come forward, I don't see the point. I thought, you know, I believe in the party's message and I believe in choice, so I step forward. So here's the NDP's platform. The party wants to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2021. And it wants to work with the Public Utilities Board to develop a, what it calls a realistic plan to keep electricity costs affordable at 13 cents a kilowatt hour. It also wants to create a $25 a day childcare program. And the party says it wants to create a green fund to support local businesses and social enterprises. As well, the NDP says it is committed to democratic voter reform. We are offering tangible solutions to very serious problems that are, are being uh, proposed by the people of the province. We are very concerned about uh, the hydroelectricity costs. We're very concerned about accessibility of childcare and education. We are very concerned about women's rights. And we are advocating strong policies that are going to help rectify those things. To Central now, where a tight race is shaping up in the district of exploits for this election, the Liberal incumbent faces the brother of the man that he unseated in the last election and an independent candidate who can't be ruled out either. With the election just a week and a half away, the Central Newfoundland district is becoming one of the districts to watch. Here and now's Katie Breen reports. Making the rounds at a care home in Botwood, Liberal candidate Jerry Dean campaigning to keep his seat. He won by just 165 votes the last time. Since getting in, he says he's helped build two long-term care homes, create a new unit for dementia patients, and fix some of the roads. 
just because I'm not, I haven't been always outspoken in front of a TV camera or a microphone, that does not mean that uh, this former mayor and this current MHA hasn't been standing tall and proud for the people in this district. PC candidate Pleeman Forsey has run five political campaigns and was president of the Tory District Association. He's trying to switch the district back to blue. His brother, Clayton Forsey, represented exploits for a decade before Dean took him out. Now he's the younger Forsey's campaign manager. And uh, as I go door to door, yes, I get comments that you're Clayton's brother, are you? I say, yes, I do. And if we can drag something from that, well, I'll take it. Both he and independent candidate Gloria Cooper believe the area needs better representation. Under the Liberals, a biofuel plant expected to bring 100 permanent jobs fell through, and the medical center in Botwood had its emergency room hours slashed. It's an issue that went away very quietly. I believe it's an issue we need to raise again, and we need to ensure that there's no further erosion of services in the District of Exploits. Cooper is a teacher and guidance counselor. She wants people to reevaluate how they vote. The X doesn't have to go to someone from an established party. As an independent, she says, she's free from partisan restraints. Support for all three. There's no clear front runner, and the incumbent knows that. Yeah, I haven't kept everybody happy, but we've done quite a bit of good work for, for, the, for the bigger picture. And I would ask the people of my district to remember that Jerry Dean did not arrive on the scene three and a half years ago out of nowhere. I've got an history, I've got a background, I, and I'm, I'm, more, I'm very proud of what I've done and very happy to have given pretty well all of my adult life to the people in this district. Katie Breen, CBC News, Bishops Falls. Now staying with voting day, Elections NL is looking for people to work at polling stations across the province on May the 16th, and you can apply online from the Elections NL website. Now, Elections NL points out that you must be 18 years of age or older. You have to be a Canadian citizen as well as a resident of the province before voting day, and you also have to be a resident of the district where you want to work. So you can contact Elections NL for more information. A warm day. We saw a number of double digit highs across the province. Uh, 12 degrees in Cornerbrook, 13 in Deer Lake, and then up through Labrador, we saw those warm temperatures as well. Labrador City and Churchill Falls both reaching a high near 12 degrees today. Now, looking at the satellite radar, nothing going on. We saw some cloud cover a little bit earlier up through the northern peninsula as well as uh, Bonavista North, but that should move out as we head through the night tonight. And we can thank uh, a low pressure system for the cloud cover moving back in as we head through at least the first half of tomorrow and then through Labrador as well. We're going to see some rain and snow along the northeast coast. That's the story as well, but I'll have all the full details on your forecast coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, a nonprofit organization in St. John's is looking into allegations of harassment by a high level member of Choices for Youth. This comes after an anonymous email sent by desperate whistleblowers was distributed to local newsrooms. CBC News has also received the email but has been unable to verify the claims at this time. The allegations outline bullying, harassment, sexual harassment, mismanagement, and abuse of power. In a statement, Choices for Youth says the allegations are being reviewed and that it does not relate to youth or clients of the nonprofit. Well, a number of drivers fined for driving with expired vehicle registration has spiked over the last year. This comes after the province stopped mailing out reminders as a way to save money in May of 2018. Drivers now have to keep track of when to renew their vehicle registration or sign up for email reminders. The number of drivers fined the $250 since then has jumped by more than 25%. And the average number of fines over the last four years is 1,200. Now for 2018, that number spiked and is up to 1,500 fines. CBC requested an interview with Service NL, but the province declined, citing the provincial election campaign. Well, a few Newfoundland and Labrador musicians picked up East Coast Music Awards in Charlottetown last night. The group Ouroboros took home an ECMA statue for Jazz Recording of the Year. 
Classical guitarist Eugene Cormier from Corner Brook won for Classical Composition of the Year, and Paul Brace won an award for Inspirational Recording of the Year. Brace recorded the album Liars and Actors while undergoing aggressive cancer treatment in 2018. He was battling Hodgkin's lymphoma and had to wear a surgical mask during recording sessions. Brace is now in remission. And some different awards were handed out in St. John's over the weekend for the Social Innovation Challenge. Participants pitched business proposals for products and services that are financially sustainable, have positive social impact, are environmentally friendly, or are spiritually grounded. They spent the day workshopping their ideas and learning from mentors, and they also practiced their pitch skills on some of our CBC colleagues. The winner of this year's CBC Pitch Prize was Bo Samongo for his startup called Holocene. He's developing software to help disaster planning and response teams locate what they need when they need it most. So when you look at disaster response and planning teams, they, have, they use a number of different assets. They have materials, supplies, vehicles, and also food and shelter. And what we do is that we use these industrial tags and we tag these assets. And from there we have, we've developed software where you can find or identify the location, the physical location of that particular asset that you've tagged. And you have the identification, so for instance, if it, you've tagged equipment, like say a pump, you know that, okay, this is a pump for, which is in this location at this time. Well, the Social Innovation Challenge also gave out prizes for the pitches. Samongo came in second place and won $1,000 for startup funding. The top prize of the day went to Sarah Crocker and Adam Gravatt. They won $1,500 for their farm-to-table business called Seed to Spoon. Well, you likely have heard by now, there is a new addition to the royal family. Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, and Prince Harry are proud parents of their first child, a boy born early this morning. He doesn't have a name yet and won't be shown in public for a couple of days more, but Prince Harry expressed his joy to reporters outside Windsor Castle. I haven't been at many births. Um, <laughs> this is definitely my first birth. Uh, it was amazing, absolutely incredible, and as I said, I'm so incredibly proud of my wife um, and as every father and parent would ever say, you know, your, your baby is absolutely amazing, but this little thing is, is, is absolutely to die for, so I'm just over the moon. News of the birth was also announced on the couple's Instagram account and in more traditional fashion outside Buckingham Palace, the royal baby weighed seven pounds, three ounces at birth. He is the queen's eighth grandchild, great grandchild, and is seventh in line to the throne. And in local sports news, the Newfoundland Growlers could clinch the series tonight with a game six win on home ice. Here's the team at mile one this morning with a practice skate. The team lost Friday's game two to one in overtime against the Manchester Monarchs. Zach O'Brien scored the team's only goal. The Growlers lead the series against the Monarchs three to two and could close out the North Division series and move on to the ECHL's Eastern Conference Finals. The puck drops at seven o'clock. From Joey Smallwood to Danny Williams to Beaumont Hamill to people who catch goats, this is the Avalon Heritage Fair, the regional fair. We'll show you some of the best projects here that's coming up. What a better way to celebrate than over beer, so I can't wait. Marking the 100th anniversary of the world's first transatlantic flight with a special anniversary beer. Zach Gowdy tells us how Landwash Brewery is trying to raise a toast to this piece of local history.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Order your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, it sure felt like spring out there today across most of the province with the, those temperatures in the double digits. Now, currently uh, still sitting close to that. So 11 degrees in Cornerbrook, 7 in St. John's and up through Labrador. Uh, still quite mild, 11 degrees in Lab City. Now, that is going to change as we head through the night tonight. We can thank a system that's moving through. So here's a look at the uh, satellite and radar. Nothing really going on as far as radar goes, but satellite, you can see we've got a couple of uh, systems in place. So one just off the coast, and then we've got another system that's moving in tonight for Western Labrador and that's what's going to bring in uh, some of those cooler temperatures along with the potential for some snow already uh, through the overnight. We're going to see that rain and then switch over to snow as those uh, temperatures dip back down into the single digits. So here's a look at uh, what we're expecting across the island. Temperatures ranging from minus one to two degrees for the Avalon. Those northwesterlies a little bit brisk around 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Along the west coast, those winds should be quite light. And then that potential for some showers up through St. Anthony or flurries to start then changing over to showers anywhere along the west co uh, northeast coast rather. We're going to see that certainly move in by morning up through Labrador. Same thing along the coast uh, with the potential for some freezing drizzle around uh, Nain and Cartwright tonight as those temperatures hover between zero and one degree and those light, generally light winds as well. And then for uh, Lab City, we're going to see uh, sitting around one degree for uh, that with that potential for snow. Again, snow tonight, two to four centimeters and then changing over to uh, or rather rain changing over to snow. Tomorrow afternoon, we're going to see uh, that system continue to creep a little bit further east. So Lab City, you're going to continue to be in that uh, snow. It looks like with a couple of more centimeters through the day. Otherwise, generally a mix of sun and cloud for most of the island tomorrow afternoon. We'll see some cloud cover push in thanks to that system towards the evening hours and the overnight will start to see some rain move in. So as far as temperatures go, should be another nice day uh, in the mid to single mid to high single digits. Marystown tapping into some warmer air though uh, with sunshine and 12 degrees. Northwesterlies continuing to be quite brisk, so somewhere between 30 and 50 kilometers per hour. And again, can't rule out the chance of a few showers again with that uh, potential for some sunny breaks as well. Uh, as we head west though and south should be mainly sunny with those double digit highs and you'll see that along the west coast as well. Stephenville 10 degrees. Portobas going to see that uh, cloud move in a little bit earlier and then potentially that rain towards the evening and overnight hours. Northern Peninsula best chance where we could see some either rain or snow tomorrow. Generally looking at that cloud cover northwesterlies 15 to 20 and then up through Labrador. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay should be the warm spot in the mid to high single digits with plenty of sunshine. But as we head west, that's where we get a little bit messy. So three degrees for Lab City. Again, another two, potentially four more centimeters of snow on the way for you. And then up through Maine, that looks like that should be shower. So looking ahead, not too bad as far as temperatures go, but I'll have all those details coming up. Carolyn. Thanks, Ashley. Well, hundreds of student finalists from Eastern Newfoundland brought their history projects to Portugal Cove St. Phillips over the weekend. Colorful displays jammed the gym at Brookside Intermediate for the 2019 Avalon Regional Heritage Fair. Now, heritage fairs encourage students to explore personal links with the history and heritage of the province and the country. Anthony met up with some of the young keen historians. traditional fiddle music because I played uh, fiddle and my aunt played fiddle so I did it off of Rufus, Emil, and Danette. Tell me about your project and why you wanted to do this. Um, it's about my great great uncle Matthew Rossiter. He fought in World War One. He actually died on July 1st 1916 and um, I wanted to do it so I could learn more about my family's heritage. My third great grandfather, he was the official goat and pounder of St. John's. Back in the day in St. John's, everyone owned goats. They were as common as stray dogs or stray cats because they were useful. People liked them for their, uh, their wool, for their meat, for their milk, and everybody had a goat. But goats, were, they were all over the place and they eat everything. They ate the laundry off of clotheslines, they ate the salted fish, they ate all the flowers, they ate everything that they could find. 
and they were just such big nuisances that my grandfather had to go around and he had to catch all the goats. Okay, Luke, so uh, tell me a bit, what are you gonna play? Muscles in the Corner. Any reason you chose that song or that tune? It's probably the most well-known Fast Newfoundland song. All right, here we go, Luke, take it away. Topic, Danny Williams, hero or villain, where do you come down on this? We find that it's very controversial, this topic, and that people can have different opinions, and if everybody who made a mistake was a villain, then we would all be villains. We did like a short survey with like our family members and things, and we asked them, do you think that Danny Williams is a hero or a villain? And when we did research, we only seen things that were heroic that he did, and okay. that, that we thought were heroic, but then, as we did more research, we found more things that were villain-like. So we put them both on the board and said, well, you can decide. My project is about a girl named Anne Harvey, and she was the oldest out of 11 children, and she was 17 years old at the time, and her dad, George Harvey, one day spotted a keg in a straw bed wash ashore, and when they set out, they found a bunch of people on this rock called the Wreck Rock. So their dad, George Harvey, threw out a billet, which right. the immigrants then tied to a rope. Okay. And their dog, named Harry Man, swam out and he pulled the rope onto the boat and pulled the immigrants onto the boat. So tell me about your project. This is a Cougar Flight 491. And I decided to do it because my uncle is on it and I have a few pictures here. This is me. This person here, yeah. he, made, he just came back from a flight, so he let me have his helmet, so he let me put his helmet on. Okay, what made you want to do this? I was really interested in it, and I wanted to learn a lot more about it. Okay, and what did you learn? I learned how it happened, and I also learned about some features in the search and rescue helicopter, and I was just sad because I, I just wanted to do it. Right, because I guess this was an uncle that you, you wouldn't have known very well. I, I, I didn't get to meet him, actually. I was seven months short. Right. Well, listen, it's an important story, and uh, I, I'm glad to see that you took it seriously and you learned a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. What an amazing group of young people. Congratulations to everyone who took part. Well, the 100th anniversary of the world's first transatlantic flight is fast approaching. There's a big exhibition planned at Admiralty House Museum in Mount Pearl. But that's not all that's brewing. A special commemorative beer is now in the tanks at Landwash Brewery and should be ready just in time to toast this chapter in local history. Here and now, Zach Gowdy tells us more. Everything that we're doing today kind of starts over here at these tanks. This beer tells a story with its recipe. It's the story of an air race 100 years ago that took off just down the road from Landwash Brewery. This is a celebration of something amazing that happened right here on Mount Pearl, the first flight. Uh, these pilots taking off, coming here to Newfoundland for this huge race. And what a better way to celebrate than over beer, so I can't wait. Admiralty House Museum is holding a big exhibition about the transatlantic air race. For opening night, it asked Landwash Brewery to fill the glasses with something special. So Landwash came up with transatlantic ale. We really wanted to do something interesting to kind of celebrate this, uh, this museum event, but at the same time, we wanted to make a beer that was really, really flavorful. So we're kind of riffing on the transatlantic idea by using some New World malt, which is malt from PEI, from Shoreline Malting, really new maltery, and uh, some Old World hops, some East Kent Golding hops from England, to kind of bring the, both sides of the Atlantic together. In the summer of 1919, teams of ambitious aviators flocked to Newfoundland to attempt the world's first non-stop flight across the Atlantic Ocean. The air race caused a stir on both sides of the pond. On June 19th, John Alcock and Arthur Brown took off from Lester's Field in Mount Pearl and completed the harrowing voyage before crashing into a bog in Ireland. The pair were knighted and their famous flight enshrined in history. Whoever wants to go up. On May 13th, an exhibition about the air race opens at Admiralty House Museum. Transatlantic Ale will be on the menu 
and afterwards on tap at Landwash Brewery. But just as Alcock and Brown had to race the competition, Landwash is racing to get the beer ready on time. This one's a little tight, but uh, we'll, we'll get it done and it'll be delicious. Okay, one, two, three. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, Mount Pearl. Now this is truly sibling rivalry. Meet two brothers running in the provincial election for different parties. How's their mom going to vote? I don't think she's going to tell us, but let's find out. Welcome back to Here and Now. Election campaigns are a complicated time for political relations, especially so when those relations involve, well, your relations. Take, for instance, the tangly NDP Tory tale of the Brothers Din. Well, Mary, thank you for inviting me into your house. You're welcome. <laughs> so uh, tell me about uh, Paul and uh, Jim. What were, they, what were they like growing up? Oh, um... <laughs> They were mischievous, I suppose, and they're just like, they're just ordinary and, the, and like all boys and that growing up, they're good, you know. Mm -hmm. They get into little scrapes and stuff, you know. Did you realize when they were children that someday they would both want to be politicians? No, never entered my mind that they would do that. 
Did they ever come asking you for any advice? No, I don't think it. They sort of knew just what they wanted to do. I tried to persuade them not to. Did you? Go, oh, yes. Why? I didn't, I didn't don't want anyone to go in politics. So, but then I, I said, well, that's all right. Do what you want to do. You can't tell a young man now in their 50s, you know, what to do. Right. And I said, I'll support you. Well, well as a man in my 50s, I'm really glad you describe us as young. Well, young <laughs> compared to me. <laughs> so wh when, you, when you tried to tell them maybe you shouldn't do this, what did you say to them? I said, go on politics. And, no, what are you doing that for? And they were the retired, you know, and they had an easier life. And, uh, and uh, I probably said to Jim, you've got grandchildren now, and, you know, spend some time. But So when they were children, was Jim the kind of kid who would uh, maybe share his toys a little bit more, like one would expect a new Democrat to do? <laughs> yes, he, ha he more or less had to. You'd say, Jim, let them have it, you know. Let, uh, let Paul have it. Let Mike have it, you know. And that's with the oldest one, and they're sort of, I think there's something about the oldest child that they sort of look after the rest, Okay, so too, Jim, you know. Jim's older than Paul. Yeah. All right, now what yeah. about Paul? Did he, uh, did he show a business entrepreneurial spirit at a young age? Well, at a young age, he was more competitive. Really? In a sense, yes, in the, in the sports and that, you know. I must say, you know, and as he got in high school, he was in the speak-offs and things like that, you know. Okay, so he started in speak-offs as a young person. Yeah. Mm. So that could have been a sign that he was destined for politics. <laughs> well, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but did he ever have, um, I don't know, a lemonade stand and sort of yes, try? Yes, yes. He did? They had a lemonade stand. They'd be do doing that. I think most of them did. Okay. Yeah. And so he understood profit. I guess so, yes. <laughs> so how do you feel about the fact that you have one son who's running as a conservative and one who's running as a new Democrat? Well, I feel all right about it now. That's what they want to do. Right. You know, and, and, uh, and like I said to Jim, I'll support you. And I said the same to Paul. Mm -hmm. I didn't think Paul was going in politics. But what choice did you have? You're their mother. <laughs> That's right. I I had to say the same to both. Right. So I guess the good news is that neither Paul nor Jim are candidates in the district where you live. No, that's right. Right. Mm. Because then you would have a choice to make. I would. Right. So if you had to vote for one or the other, who would you vote for? Oh, I can't say that. <laughs> That's an unfair question now. Oh, yeah, I, I hate to put you on the spot, but that, that doesn't mean you're voting liberal, right? Well, I didn't say that either now. <laughs> you know? you got to keep your options open. I tell you, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. What's election night going to be for you as you're watching the results come in? Are you going to watch the election? Well, when Paul got elected there a few months ago, was it, I think? Yeah, yeah. in the by-election? Yeah, well, we were in the in the paradise where we were watching the elections and that. Right. So I don't know where. I'll have to stay home now because I can't, <laughs> I can't go one place. I'll have to be running back and forth to see how everyone is doing. Right. I'll and have to stay home and listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Mary, I really appreciate you inviting me in. Hey, Mom, Mom, we told you no comment. No oh, comment. I was going to see you again. No, no, How you doing? Hit the road, okay. man. Hit the road. I think, I think oh, I've asked you. Hit the road. Get out. No, yeah. no, no. All right. No. We'll see you. Hit the road. This, this, no, really hit the road. No, no, no. Oh, my God. The Din brothers aren't the only siblings running in this election, though they're the only ones running for different parties. Tom and Bob Osborne, of course, they're both running for the Liberals. And Chess Crosby and his sister Beth, they are running for the PCs. Ariana Kellen now with their story. The year was 1999, and the Liberal Party was far from the minds of the Osborne family. Are there any Liberals in the room right now, we should probably ask? I should hope not. <laughs> That's Osborne matriarch Sheila Osborne. Here she is with fellow Tory MHA Tom Osborne, who also happens to be her son. I'll probably take Bob French and put him right here so he's closer to the leader and put you right here. Well, one of her sons. Twenty years later, both boys are on the campaign trail for the Liberals. Tom, a seasoned politician, and Bob, the rookie. You know, four or five years ago, uh, I don't know if I would have gave the Liberals a chance. Uh, when Dwight came in, uh, I was a little skeptical, and then ever since he got in and the way he's writing the ship now, uh, I said there's, there's no doubt in my mind that this is the way we got to go. 
The professional appraiser turned political hopeful has lots to learn, but Bob Osborne also knows what to expect. My parents instilled in us, uh, you know, in all of your dealings, be honest and, and op operate with integrity. You know, I, so I, I've got a great deal of confidence that uh, my brother will operate the same way. And as it turns out, it's not just the Osborne siblings marking this territory. Don't pay any attention to these polls, but if there's one comes out that shows me winning, I'll certainly uh, support it. <laughs> no, not John Crosby, his two kids, Beth and Chess. Beth running in Virginia waters and Chess in Windsor Lake. Uh, no, I, I occasionally get asked if he's my father, so I, I enjoy that aspect. No, he's my older brother. Uh, and no, Beth. <laughs> I get asked if John Crosby, my father, is my brother, so... Uh. <laughs> The siblings grew up in a political household and say they've seen firsthand that you can make a difference. If I didn't give it a try, then I should stop talking politics because, you know, you can't be out criticizing things if you're not willing to do it yourself. Now, when Beth Crosby goes to vote in two weeks' time, her brother and PC leader will be on the ballot in her home district. And if there was any doubt... He's, his sign is on my lawn. <laughs> Arianna Kelland, CBC News. St. John's. Welcome back. In international news, officials in Moscow are refusing to ground the country's fleet of Sukhoi superjets despite concerns in the wake of yesterday's horrific plane crash. Officials spent the day combing through the remains of the charred passenger plane and have now recovered both of its flight data recorders. 41 of the 78 people on board were killed when the Russian-made superjet tried to make an emergency landing late Sunday and burst into a deadly fireball when the tail made contact with the runway. There are suggestions a lightning strike after takeoff may have triggered the initial emergency, but experts say planes are built to withstand lightning and point out this type of aircraft has had technical problems in the past. Donald Trump's former personal lawyer took a parting shot at the U.S. president before heading to prison today. I hope that when I rejoin my family and friends, that the country will be in a place without xenophobia, injustice, and lies at the helm of our country. 
Michael Cohen began his three year sentence this morning at a federal prison. He pleaded guilty in connection to hush money payments made to women who allegedly had affairs with Trump. Cohen also admitted lying to Congress and to multiple financial crimes. The 52 year old New Yorker had been Trump's self described fixer for more than a decade. A somber celebration to honor those killed during the Holocaust was held at Memorial University. The annual memorial is put together by the Jewish community Havura. This year's theme was Voices Not Forgotten, Poetry from Victims and Survivors. The event also paid tribute to the late Philip Reitman. Here now's Jeremy Eaton has more. The Holocaust was something should never happen again. What we and a lot of other people see is a world deteriorating where political leaders give permission to hate, attack groups for political action, where shooters uh, enter places of worship or just places where people are, Toronto streets, What is happening is our annual Holocaust Memorial Service. Jewish people in general, however observant they are or aren't, are enjoined to remember. We're sometimes referred to as people of the book. We remember the dead when Jewish people visit a grave. You put a stone on the grave to say, I was there. I've done it on my father's grave. I've done it on Jewish graves in war cemeteries. Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Eight days ago, Poway, California, where four people were shot. One died who put herself in the line of fire between herself and the Rabbi Yisrael Goldstein. Samuel Ziegler, Simcha Ziegler. But what a lot of people don't realize is that being part of the Jewish people, it's an ethno-religious sphere. So sure, we all share a religion, but it's also an ethnicity. This, in part, uh, was because of who we were and what we practiced, but largely it was because of the blood that runs through our veins. The newer generations aren't going to feel necessarily that same pain. So we have to remind ourselves every year to always be humble, to pay respects to those who were before us. Because if we forget, we forget our past, we forget our future. We hold this to say it is time not only to remember, but for everyone who is upset by what is happening to say never again.
Well, we talked about that spring like day today. We'll take a quick look at the forecast again for tomorrow. Very much spring like down, uh, especially for the west coast towards the interior and then up through Labrador. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay going to feel like seven degrees tomorrow afternoon with plenty of sunshine. We'll see that snow move in uh, for Lab City though through the day. So looking ahead, that's all going to change and we can thank a cold front for that. So if we watch that sweep through as we head through the day on Wednesday, it's going to stay quite chilly up through Labrador through the afternoon and then uh, that potential for snow again. And then we'll see that cold front sweep across the island, which will bring that shower activity towards the evening hours by the time it makes it uh, towards the Avalon, not quite reaching the northern uh, the northeast coast. And then as those temperatures dip, we're going to see that change over to uh, just a chance of a few flurries. So here's a look at that temperature. You can see where that cold front is. Only three degrees should be your afternoon high in Port of Basque on Wednesday as you head a little bit further north. We'll get back into those double digits. And then again, sunshine to start, uh, especially for the northeast coast. And then we'll see that potential for showers towards the evening hours up through Labrador, though. Still looking at that potential for flurries and three degrees. Happy Valley Goose Bay, another seven degree day, it looks like. So looking ahead to Thursday. Thursday and uh, it'll stay a little bit or at least uh, unsettled through the day on Thursday. That will stick around at least through the first half of Friday. We should see some clearing, although this model is showing uh, mainly cloud cover. Wouldn't be surprised to see some peaks of sun through the day, especially up through Labrador and then down along the southwestern portion of uh, the island. And you can see that cloud cover uh, through the overnight as well. Towards Saturday morning, that's when the next weather maker will move in. So we're going to see uh, a mix again for Labrador. Lab West likely staying in that snow. And then we'll see. Uh, along the southwestern portion of the island as well. So we're going to see a little bit of a changeover and that's because those temperatures will be dipping into the overnight hour. So over the next five days, this is what we're looking at. Six degrees, generally above zero between uh, the mid to high single digits right across St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. It looks like uh, Wednesday we're looking at that potential for some showers again. Maybe some peaks of sun, certainly on Thursdays when we're seeing that shower activity. And then I have snow in the forecast, but that's just the slight chance and it will likely either be in the morning or the evening hours there for uh, the east, eastern portion of the island. Central Newfoundland, 12 degrees tomorrow. We're going to stay in those double digits right through Wednesday. Dip a little bit Thursday and Friday thanks to that cold front and then Saturday will return to uh, near seasonal with that potential for some rain. Western Newfoundland, 13 beautiful degrees tomorrow afternoon. Again, that rain on Wednesday. Friday looks like a return of that sunshine. Have that temperature sitting around 13 degrees Saturday as well. Just a slight chance of a few showers. And then for Eastern Labrador, fog tonight and then the first half of tomorrow. Then we should see that clearing reaching a high near 7 degrees and then rain possible for Wednesday and Thursday. And then for Western Labrador, 2 to 4 centimeters. As I mentioned, tomorrow snow continues on Wednesday. Finally going to see some sunshine when uh, Friday rolls around with those temperatures sitting around 7 degrees. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Here in St. John's, the Pick It Up Cleanup campaign kicks off tonight. I was expected more than 8,000 volunteers will help collect 40 tons of garbage littering the capital city. And the first area being tackled is Kelsey Drive. In a recent audit, it was found to be the most littered area in St. John's. Volunteers are invited to meet in front of Sobeys, and everyone is welcome. And when you're done picking up trash, maybe you'll pick up a shovel and plant a tree. St. John's City Hall is aiming to make neighborhoods a little greener with its residential relief program. That'll let homeowners apply for a $150 voucher to go toward the purchase of a tree. And the city says many newer developments in the city are barren and bare, so it's taking applications for the relief program until May the 17th. In international news, the United Nations has issued a grim report on species extinction. As many as a million plant and animal species are at risk of disappearing forever. But there is a glimmer of hope, a chance to turn things around. Cass Rusi reports. Ahead of a United Nations report, demonstrators from the World Wildlife Fund staged a protest in Paris on the weekend, dressed in bumblebee costumes, a species that is under threat. The report itself says nature is in decline globally at rates unprecedented in our history, with one million species threatened with extinction, all because of human activities. There are a lot of species, individual species and habitats that are, that are suffering so significantly that they'll go to extinction. Extinction is permanent, right? 
He says in some cases the damage done could be irreversible. In terms of collectively, societally, that's too hard to say. You know, it seems like it seems quite clear that we're not there yet, that we still do have time, but we don't have time to dither around. The report offers a dire picture of nature in dramatic decline. Every corner of the planet, from insects, animals and plants, to mammals in the ocean. It's not just an environmental issue. It is an economic issue, a development issue, a security issue, uh, a social, moral and ethical issue. Some of the more threatened species include amphibians, mammals, marine mammals, fish are exploited too, with more than one third of fish stocks over harvested. But the report does offer hope. Nature reserves and wilderness areas have helped protect land and oceans. It's authors believing it's not too late to make a difference. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. Well, from protecting the planet to taking care of your front lawn, the return of spring means it's pretty soon back to cutting the grass. And in the village in southern England, lawnmower season started this weekend. Uh, that would be the British lawnmower racing season. It runs from May to October, much like the one the rest of us are familiar with. But in case you're seeing some time-saving potential here, don't kid yourself, these mowers aren't actually cutting any grass. The blades, we're pretty sure, have been removed for safety reasons. Organizers say the races started back in 1973. An actor in Regina is inspiring many people thanks to his groundbreaking role in the new Netflix show Black Summer. Mustafa Alipsi was born deaf in Syria. He and his family fled the country when he was just 12 years of age, and he shared his story with CBC Saskatchewan with some help from an interpreter. We did some acting uh, out at the dump here in Regina. It was just kind of a, a big dump, and uh, we set up my scene for the audition, and like uh, I had to kind of fake becoming a zombie, right? And I had to show this in this scene and whatever. And so when that was finished, um, we sent that off to the director in Calgary and the director saw me and was like, oh, he picked me. He said he wanted to do a callback. So they said, I said, oh, I'm really hopeful that I could do that, sure. So I ended up flying out to Calgary after I did my callback and uh, I was feeling like just in awe, like, this, this is my first time in Canada and now here I am flying off to Calgary and, and then I got to meet Jamie King and I'm on set and Jamie King I saw her they're like wow she's a movie star and she came up and said hello and I was so excited but I was so nervous and she gave me a hug and and you know I just really loved her and how she treated me on set we, we were supportive of each other and the set was just really amazing all this, the crew <laughs> so when you think of the show that I was in, I was the only deaf character, right? And that was that was really great. But I would like to see more and more deaf people being included in movies. Um, it's not about one deaf person going off together, but it's about a deaf community. And it's about our heart and showing that um, we represent we represent the same part of the world and, and I know more and more deaf people are hoping to see deaf role models in movies and, and things, but when you're seeing one, two, maybe four deaf actors, when you think of all of the actors in Hollywood, you know, it's time that we start thinking about um, making that more accessible where it's more of a representation of what society looks like. So I would like to see that there are more deaf actors in movies. I've, I've been getting a lot of messages actually from Syrians and deaf Syrians saying, Mustafa, you're showing us that, that, that we can be supported and that there is hope for our future. And I'm hoping that I can do more, more acting in the future so that I can keep showing the deaf community that you can develop if you try. Well, here's a, a beautiful weather photo. This was taken Easter weekend. It's kind of hard to feel like uh, spring is right around the corner when you see a picture like this, but I assure you it is. I'll tell you where this photo was taken when we come back after the break.
Well, just before the break, we showed you the weather photo of the day with that uh, ice. I think it gave you a little bit of a clue where that was taken. So it was actually uh, Anchor Point uh, was where that photo was taken. So thank you so much for sending that photo in, that moose enjoying the beautiful view there of those icebergs. Lots of icebergs uh, around. We're getting tons of photos, so I can't wait to see what yours look like. If you have any that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. So that's it for me. I'm going to send it back to uh, Carolyn and Anthony. Thanks, yeah, Ashley. So I was going to say, here we are, but we're not really. Uh, do you know when my quarantine up here ends, uh, <laughs> Carolyn? <Okay. laughs> Well, it's, oh, it's only temporary, this distance, uh, me in the studio and you in the newsroom tonight uh, until yeah. after the, the election. So mm -hmm. They're fixing up our election 2019 set. Uh, you get a chance to see that on May the 16th. And uh, Carolyn, I guess I'll see you sometime between now and uh, election night. All right. We'll good night. See you and good night, everyone.